Do we have Scott on? Is he dialed in? He was on live, but his connection froze. Brianna, do you want to reach out to him and see if he can at least call in? I'm reaching out to him now. Oh, there he is. And he, he's here. Sorry. Sorry about that. That your connection froze because it's so cold there. Exactly. <laughs> I was actually starting to tell you guys, we, we, I had this tradition where I would take the office to the Nats game every, for a game every summer. And I remember one game where we went, when we entered the, when the ball game started, it was 108. And when the game oh. ended, it had, it had cooled down to a brisk 103. <laughs> it was a very dry game. But um, they, had, they had a tremendous number of home runs because apparently the heat makes the air thinner. And so uh, we're, we're, um, we're at the meeting now. All right. OK. Very good. All right. Welcome all to our July monthly meeting. I'm joined this evening by my fellow board members, Sab Bereda, our vice chair, Steve Bumba, Naomi Shelton, Leah Crusi, and Jim Sandman. Ricardo Ganjim is unable to join us this evening, and Saba will have to dial off early. Both have submitted proxy votes for tonight's agenda items. Once again, our meeting will be virtual. There'll be optional meeting, uh, optional video for board members and presenters for tonight's meeting, and we encourage presenters to join by video. Before we start, I want to acknowledge that our schools, school leaders, families, and staff are all grappling with the reopening of schools this fall. That will not be a surprise to any of you. I know this is one of the toughest decisions, if not the toughest decision that schools will make this year. And to make this more challenging is the fact that experts disagree on when and how schools should reopen. As well, as you've all seen, the number of cases and hospital hospitalizations in DC um, are going up and down. We'll continue along with schools to work with government agencies, including DC Health, OSSI, and the DME about how to safely reopen. We encourage school leaders to listen to their teachers and families to make the best decision, whether it's all virtual or a hybrid, as to what they do. PCSB is tracking school decisions on the homepage of our website so that you can see how the status of schools change over the next few weeks. Tonight is a special board meeting for PCSB for a couple of reasons. First, it's our last board meeting for the 2019-2020 school year. And secondly, it's our last board meeting with Scott Pearson as executive director. Scott joined the board in January 2012. When he joined the board, his two children were in elementary school. Now, Sonia is a 2020 college graduate, virtual though it may be, and uh, Jasper is entering his third year of college. His wife, Diana, believes she's there somewhere, or maybe just be listening in. Uh, there, are, there she is. Oh, everybody's there. The whole, the whole Pearson clan is there. Um, uh, we know that Scott's job was demanding with long hours, travel, and last minute meetings. Uh, there were probably dinners missed and family events delayed. And you yourself, Diana, have an incredibly successful career, and one perhaps even busier than he is. Um, but uh, the students of, and the, of the city and the staff of the PCSB owe you and the entire Pearson family a great deal of thanks. We have several items for public hearing and for vote this evening, but we're going to spend uh, the first part of our time together recognizing Scott's service. And I'm going to begin, as will the board, with some reflections of my own. Every Friday morning for the last two and a half years has started for me with an 8 a.m. call. And that's been to Scott. Uh, as a new chair of the board, we slipped into that rhythm pretty easily. And during those calls, he often provided me with as much guidance on being a board chair as I provided him in navigating the many decisions and challenges that face PCSB, our schools, and their families. We've had a good partnership, I think, and I will miss it. Across that time, we've talked from cars and airports, from vacations as far away as Machu Picchu, if I remember correctly. Um, from coffee shops and doctor's offices, and most recently, while walking dogs outdoors during the pandemic. Scott's imprint on the PCSB is deep and will be lasting. He brought to this role so much. His business expertise, his own board and board leadership experience, his perspective as a father, and as well, an intellect and critical mindset that belies his humanity and his heart. He's deployed these skills in so many settings during his tenure, 
none perhaps have been as challenging as these last six months. I'm so glad for his leadership in particular during this moment. And I'd be remiss not to mention the great team that he's built, in particular, his senior leaders, Rashida Young, Tamika Bowden, Lenora Robinson Mills, and Sarah Cheatham. Our schools and our students are better for his and their efforts. Scott, as all great leaders, also knew when the time was right for the next chapter, for himself and for PCSB. None of us, however, anticipated how eventful that chapter would begin. Scott, thank you for all that you've done for our city, its families, and its children. Others tonight, I'm sure, will speak to your many accomplishments. I'll simply say that it has never been easy, even when you made it look so, and these last several months are testament to the fact. But you've always been unwavering in your focus and clear as to the priorities that have guided you. You've never feared the unpop an unpopular decision, and at those times when folks have gone so far as to question your integrity, you've remained constant and for the most part calm and always kept at the forefront the best interest of kids. Some may deba debate the principles you ascribe to, but your North Star has never wavered. Students and families and their right to a great education. It's imperfect to say the least to be doing this by Zoom, but I hope for the day when we can all be back together in person and raise a glass and toast to Scott, someone I've had the privilege to work with and who's become a friend. And it's a friendship that I look forward to enjoying for many years to come. With that, I'll turn the mic over to my fellow board members to share some reflections. And I'll start with Saba. Thanks, Rick. I'm Saba Beretta, Vice Chair of the Board. And I actually first learned about Scott's work well before I came to the board in 2016. Back in 2014, when I was at the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, we were looking for good examples of data collection on school discipline, and someone suggested that we look at DC PCSB and the equity reports that Scott had initiated. We all know the equity reports now, but back then there were few cities publishing subgroup data on discipline. And I think the equity reports are a good example of Scott's contribution to the education sector. He believed that if schools saw the data and the disparities between students, and that he and his staff provided opportunities for schools to collaborate on ways to reduce exclusionary discipline, they would think of creative ways to do just that. And he was right. I'm proud to see many of our schools have significantly reduced the use of exclusionary discipline and the conversation around school discipline has shifted. Scott, you've always believed the best in our students, our teachers, our schools, and your staff. You put the best people in leadership positions and allow them to do their best. You've ensured that the board had the information that we needed to make our best decisions. And because of your unwavering belief in our schools and our students and in your dedication, we have seen the, high, the number of high quality options for students increase across the city. We haven't always agreed on practices or policy, but I'm extremely grateful for your leadership and your willingness to be challenged and to adapt to challenges. I appreciate that you always try to come up with, with solutions instead of being stuck on the problem. Education is hard and being a leader in this field can be a thankless task. So hopefully you've heard some thanks in your final weeks in this position. Thank you so much for all the work you've done on behalf of children in DC. And now you, I know you will be great in whatever you choose to do in your next chapter. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thanks, Emma. Steve? Yeah, I'm happy to go next. Um, I hope Scott is here to, to hear this. Um, you have to have an element of roasting in, in these, uh, these goodbyes. So I will acknowledge that uh, Scott and I have often brought different points of view to this work. Um, but in all seriousness, I think uh, democratic institutions are stronger when they can accommodate different points of view. I will also say one thing I learned about Scott is that if you are going to challenge his position, you better be prepared to defend your point because he will cite a study from 10 years ago and he'll pull a data point from the footnote on page 14. Uh, and, I, and I actually, I really respect the thoroughness and the empiricism that Scott brings to this work. More fundamentally though, um, a building is only as strong as the foundation upon which it is built. 
And Scott has built a very strong foundation that Dr. Walker Davis will benefit from. Uh, we, we can quibble over aspects of the PMF, but it's a transparent tool that charter leaders know about that will be used to evaluate uh, their work. Um, the, the sort of discipline metrics that Saba cited, the transparent process through which we open and close schools, Scott is the primary architect of these things. So again, I very much appreciate uh, the solid foundation that Scott has built for a charter sector that has grown and stabilized under his leadership. And I look forward to uh, learning what he's doing, what the next thing is in, in, in his, his career. I've learned uh, a good bit from working with Scott over these past five and a half years. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I'll go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Cruzy. I'm a member of the DC Public Charter School Board. I had the pleasure of first meeting Scott, I don't know, five or six years ago now, as uh, someone highly respected in the charter school community around the country and who uh, had done much to establish DC's sector as one with a high, variety, high quality choices for families and setting an example of a dynamic sector that the rest of the country admired. <laughs> So I just want to thank you, Scott, for your steadfast and relentless leadership on behalf of DC's children and families, leading this sector with a clear vision of what the role of the authorizer is, setting the conditions for excellence while also celebrating and protecting autonomy. You have set a high bar for charter schools, for public education, for public service, and just for leadership in general with both joy and, again, relentless commitment. Thank you for all that you've done. I can't wait to see what you do next. I'll go really quickly and not to repeat anything that has already been said this evening. Uh, and I believe all of my colleagues and I'm sure Jim will follow up to just say uh, how much we appreciate not only the commitment, the relentless commitment um, and the focus, but the uh, I, I'll just draw attention to the moments where Scott has been very thoughtful about um, revisiting how and when and where uh, the differences that we have had on our board and being able to, and the willingness to come around to see a different perspective. Uh, the work that he has done in the last eight years, again, as Steve pointed out, puts Dr. Walker Davis in um, the most amazing position to be able to do uh, the next phase of this work effectively. Uh, but Scott has also uh, grown tremendously in this role over the last four years. And I'd like to think that in the last two and a half that I've been a part of the board, that I've been a part of that as well. Uh, so I joined the chorus of voices to say, thank you, Scott. Uh, I, you know, can, on, you know, multiple occasions, I've thought about the first day that Scott and I met and one, the confusion on where we were actually going to meet, but two, the confusion on what we were actually meeting about. And uh, his very, you know, frank, well, do you want to be on our board? Um, and the, the, the moment of, oh, that is what we're meeting about. And now I have to reframe this entire conversation. But just the moments of um, vulnerability and honesty, um, I've been thankful for that and the, the, the ability for Scott to be approachable but also steadfast in how he goes about his work. So thank you, Scott, for all that you have added uh, over the last nearly decade. I'm Jim Sandman. I'm the junior member of the board. I <clears throat> became a member a year ago. The District of Columbia is a better place <clears throat> because Scott Pearson has been executive director of the Public Charter School Board. Our charter school system is nationally recognized for its excellence. I believe it to be the finest charter school system in the United States, and I know that view is shared by many. I think that Scott's success and his impact are the result of four characteristics. First is his fierce and single-minded focus on ensuring high quality educational opportunities for every student in the District of Columbia, every student. 
Second is his adoption of standards and policies to measure and ensure quality and fiscal integrity of all the schools and then implementing those standards and policies rigorously, even when doing so has been unpopular. Third has been his recruitment and development of a world-class staff. Uh, people who share his commitment to excellence and his passion for the mission of serving the students of the District of Columbia. I've never worked in any position I've ever held with a finer group of people. And finally is his personal integrity. Scott is honest. He's also direct. But those are, are good qualities. He's a public servant. He has served the District of Columbia extraordinarily well. I regret that we have not had more time to work together, but I'm grateful for the time that we've had. Scott, I hope our paths will continue to cross for many years to come. I consider myself lucky to have met you and to have worked with you. And I, on behalf of the District of Columbia, thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, Scott, Scott's uh, connection was a little unstable. He is dialed in, so he's hearing all of this, um, but you may not see him, his family, on the, on the screen. He comes and goes. Now, now I'm on the video. <laughs> oh, no, if the video drops, I'm also on a phone call, oh, so excellent. I'm hearing it. It's a little humbling. Thank you. Um, we now have a number of, uh, of folks uh, who've come to know Scott who'd like to say a few words as well, and uh, I'd like to open the floor to Sarah Mead to start. Thanks, Rick. And, you know, it's hard to come after all the current board members who've said so many of the wonderful things about Scott that I also, in my time on the board, was able to observe and experience working alongside him. I, as I was getting ready for this conversation, I was thinking of uh, when I first met Scott, um, I guess probably nine years ago now, um, we were looking for somebody to fill the incredibly large sho shoes left behind by Josephine Baker and really uncertain about who would be able to play that role and guide the public charter school board and our work with the schools into a new stage of um, development in response to changes that were happening in the city. And I just, um, we were so lucky that the timing that we needed to fill that role aligned with the timing when Scott was looking for his next big professional adventure. Um, in these times, it's good to be reminded that sometimes external times line up the way they're supposed to, and I trust they're happening that way for other people right now as well. Authorizing is a really strange role. Uh, authorizers have a lot of power. They can approve new entities to become public schools, and they can take that approval away. But that tremendous power comes with a very limited toolkit. Authorizers are not able to tell schools what to do the same way you might be if you were a school superintendent or to get involved in the day-to-day -day operations and go in and fix all the problems the same way many of us want to in our normal lives. And that means that effective authorizers have to act with tremendous creativity and ingenuity in a way that leverages both the hard tools of authorizing, but also the soft tools of relationships, of using data to coax and persuade people. And throughout his time in the leading the board, I have seen Scott use that ingenuity in so many different ways, as with the equity report Saba referenced, um, and in lots of ways behind the scenes that aren't as visible, and train and coach the staff on the board to do that as well. Um, Scott has always brought to this work a combination of both incredibly high demands and expectations for schools in terms of what students deserve from them, and a deep commitment to champion our charter schools and particularly to champion the autonomy of schools to fulfill their unique missions. Um, during the time that I was on the board, I had the opportunity to work with Scott and my fellow board members, Hi Don, through some uh, really unexpected challenges that occurred from time to time. We had calls on weekends, late at night, early in the morning, way too many extremely late Monday night meetings. It's fun to be reminded of that right now. Um, but the thing I learned in that was that Scott is absolutely the person that I would want to have with me in a crisis. And I think we have all seen that 
as a city in these past six months. Um, and again, so grateful for you to be in that role. Um, through all of that, Scott, I have just seen that you are a person of deep, deep integrity um, and somebody who cares so deeply for children, for all children in this city. We're at a moment in this country where we are seeing how crucial leadership is and that who we have in leadership positions makes a life and death difference for our nation, for people, for our children. And I am just so grateful for the leadership that you've shown over the past eight and a half years, Scott. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'd like to invite Skip McCoy, one of our former board chairs. Uh, hi, Don, Sarah, <coughs> Scott, Rick, uh, <laughs> and everybody else who I don't know. <laughs> I've been retired uh, roughly five years now. Um, and Scott had been, had had a long productive career even before anybody on the charter board knew about him. Uh, so that it was sort of, I don't know what phase um, Scott would call PCSB, but it, let's call it stage three or whatever. Uh, when he joined, he already had exemplified a lot of the qualities that, that Sarah just mentioned. Um, so he was on the board with when I was there roughly five years uh, and he was there long enough to cause some commotion among various constituents. But I mean the good kind of commotion, the kind of commotion that leads to positive change. Um, and he did that a lot before I left. So I can only assume that in the last five years he's continued to cause positive change. Um, but the one thing, if you, if you follow that trail that you recognize is that Scott Pearson is now getting long in the tooth. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say only administrators and faculties and parents and students can claim immediate credit for good or bad school achievement and really only students. But an authorizer, as Sarah has said, one sort of constituted as, as, as it's grown under Scott, can certainly help set standards and hold schools accountable. Um, it can provide guidance and be a cheerleader in the sector within which it must operate. And I think probably more than any of my fellow board members, I had a feel for this, the complex local government set of actors that um, Scott and his predecessor had to deal with in order to get anything done. Um, and it was an education for all of us. And I think it's one of the, one of the things that uh, Scott sort of knuckled down, went and met everybody um, in a way, held his cards to his vest, didn't there were some obvious characters he could have lambasted, but he didn't. Um, and he realized that being an authorizer in DC, as any person from DC who, who will say, you know, they're a fifth generation Washingtonian, is unlike any other place in the world. And um, you, I sort of watched for a while when Scott would deal with different parts of the district government, like a bobblehead <laughs> on a dashboard. Gee, today I met with the mayor and then the, dep the deputy mayor for education. And then we had to meet with the uh, school board, the overall school board. Um, so I think that, that Scott was able to achieve as much as he could, as he did, was, is really a testament to his stick to and his really staying focused uh, on what was important. And I think that's a, that's a credit and that's a challenge for the, the, any board in this city. Uh, I think just as students' performance is the ultimate indicator of a school's success, it is the board's staff that drives the PCSB accomplishment. We had great board members. Uh, from all, all walks of life, well-accomplished people, but it's the staff 
And even though we had late Monday night meetings, and sometimes we had some Saturday meetings, um, it's the staff that gets stuff done. And uh, Scott just brought on some great folks um, and it played the, the perfect leadership role in terms of shielding them from some of the political stuff uh, while people went about doing their, doing their work. And that's one of the signs that I, I think of a really excellent leader. Uh, so that any of the accomplishments that we've seen in the last decade is really, a lot of it is due to, yes, the, the schools, you can't take credit away from, from some of the fabulous schools that we have. Um, and I don't think anybody would say that all DC charter students are achieving their own individual peak levels of performance yet. But no astute uh, ob observer, I think, would fail to recognize the growth that students in the sector and the sector itself have enjoyed over the past decade. So Scott, I think you've left your mark on this place and the mark is a stellar one. All the best. Thank you, Skip. I just have to say, I remember I was about a year into the job and we were having a, a discussion and I said to Skip, Skip, politics has nothing to do with our work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you almost took my head off and said, Scott, I've got some educating to do for you. <laughs> um, Don Soifer, if I could turn to you. Thanks, Rick. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Skip. Uh, I'm Don Soifer. I come to you rounding out my first year as a member of the Nevada State Public Charter School Authority, where we're completing a pretty memorable year under another brilliant Wesleyan grad, Rebecca Fiden, as our executive director. When I first moved out here to the desert, I, uh, I did a lot of reading. One of my favorite books has for many years been, been Cicero's Letters. <coughs> and in, in one of my favorite of those letters to Atticus, his close friend and, and, uh, and cousin, he said, in the things that really matter, uprightness, integrity, conscientiousness, and fidelity to obligation, I put you second neither to myself nor to any other man. And I think of that because these things are exactly what Scott's work has brought to the role of chief executive of the DC Public Charter School Board. A lot of great people are here to say great things about Scott and all of them are, are totally true. Um, and he deserves all of them for the advancement he's led in, in modern charter school authorizing. I'd like to reminisce for a moment on Scott's hiring to the role of executive director near the midpoint of my term as a, a board member that lasted about 250 years. Scott was appointed by board chair, Brian Jones. Those of you who are fortunate to know Brian, recognize him as a man whose heart is pure good, as pure good a heart as anyone we've ever known. And in Scott, Brian recognized these qualities from the beginning. Cicero's things that really matter in, in a man. Great call, Brian. We miss you tonight in this meeting room where you and Scott, along with so many other good people in this room, and Darren Woodruff and Emily Bloomfield, and an incredible staff, ushered in an era of, of modern charter school authorizing, which has mapped and launched one of America's most effective government deliverers of equity of educational opportunity for all learners. Thank you, Scott, and I look forward to working together in the future. Thank you, Don. Uh, can I ask Shannon, Shannon Hodge if you're on? Um, I can't see everyone, but I think you might be there. I'm here. There you are. Hi, good evening. My name is Shannon Hodge, and on behalf of the DC Charter School Alliance, I have the honor of congratulating Scott Pearson on his years of service to DC students. Scott may be a bit nervous about what I have to say, given that on many occasions we have been on opposite sides of the table. However, through those interactions, I have come to learn a couple of things about Scott that I don't think he would mind me sharing with you tonight. First, Scott truly believes, as the National Association of Charter School Authorizers says, good authorizing leads to great charter schools. 
In every tough decision, in every unpopular recommendation, in every challenge, Scott is driven by his responsibility to lift up the entire sector. In his often misunderstood role as the leader of DC's sole authorizer, Scott has been willing to take the hits because doing so would help the sector grow stronger and grow better. It's easy for us to take for granted here in DC what good authorizing looks like. But when I speak with charter leaders from other jurisdictions, they always talk about how fortunate school leaders in DC are to be able to operate under a good authorizer. The battles they have to fight are often unfamiliar to us, many times because they are fighting against a struggling authorizer. Those are not fights we have to worry about in DC. Which is not to say that we haven't had our battles. We certainly have, and I could tell you about them if we were chatting in person over drinks at a reception. But the difference is that we're fighting about the things that matter, and we're doing so from a position that charter school leaders in other places envy, because our authorizer agrees that having great charter schools is our shared goal. The second thing I've learned about Scott is that he believes, again, as Naxa says, smart, proactive, emphasis on the proactive, authorizing can transform public education. It's often difficult to see it in the moment, but Scott is often three, four, or 20 steps ahead of where the current issue and conversation are. He understands how the pieces fit together, how the path is constructed, and he is often trying to ensure the best possible choices for DC students by ensuring that charter schools are prepared to navigate the terrain ahead, especially when they can't see it for themselves. From my new role, I can see that Scott has been fighting fights that school leaders aren't even aware of, to make sure that charter schools can fulfill their missions to serve DC students. And for that, I thank him. Let me close with an anecdote that illustrates how I've come to appreciate Scott and his work. In my first year of operating the charter school I co-founded, I was on the opposite side of the table from Scott in what was a high stakes conversation that could have gone any number of ways. In that moment, I was willing to acknowledge, albeit begrudgingly, that Scott's pressure forced me and my team to improve our school quickly. I'm confident that we would have eventually made the needed adjustments in due time. However, the challenge from Scott made us do the work with no delay, with no, dis no excuses. We did it and our students benefited from it. So did the city. And for that, Scott, I thank you and the schools thank you. Best of luck. Thanks, Shannon. Um, Maya Martin. Hi. Um, hi, Scott, and thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, I'm just so excited to share about the work that I've had the t pleasure and the privilege of doing with Scott over the past seven years, eight years almost. Um, and I think the first of that work that I ha haven't heard anybody mention yet, but that I really want to talk about is the common lottery process. Um, I remember being on the school side, running enrollment for Center City Public Charter Schools, in the city and Scott did something revolutionary, which was get all of us to agree to a common deadline. And that doesn't seem so revolutionary now as we have my school DC and a common lottery and application process. But in that moment, that was a real change for our city and for our families and for our kids to create equity for all of them in order to make sure that every single kid didn't have to figure out 20 different deadlines, 60 different deadlines and processes. And it really paved the way for making sure that we could get the equity that we now have in my school DC, something that a lot of the other jurisdictions that we talked to thought was impossible. When we talked to Denver and New Orleans and New York, they all told us that we'd have to do this work through legislation because that was the way that they had all done it for their schools. But one of the things that was critical was having Scott immediately from the forefront leading as a leader and saying that this was something that was important for our city and not just for each of us as charter leaders but also for our authorizer to say that this was something that was going to make a difference for kids and families and because of that we got 96 percent of schools both charters and dcps to participate in the very first year um, and that was just revolutionary and unheard of and that wouldn't have been possible without scott's leadership and as i move from the school side to the side where i am working directly with families and amplifying and advocating with them and their voices on the policy issues that they choose. Um, like many others on the call, Scott and I weren't always on the same page about what those issues should look like and with our parents. But what I always appreciate and respect most about who Scott is as a person is that he's committed to figuring out how do we get to the right answer. 
And he's not afraid of having those hard conversations in order to be able to get there. And so most of the time he actually led when we had disagreements where with, I know we might not agree on this, but let's figure out what we do agree on. That what we can do is drive forward policy that's done in the right ways with people at the center. And he really does care about those stories of children and families and he cares about them in particular, which for me, as a sixth generation native Washingtonian who has often seen black and brown families in particular in this city not valued in the ways that we deserve, is so important for his leadership and the way in which he led um, the PCSB. And it even showed itself in COVID. Um, I loved Scott's commitment to making sure that every child had the internet access that they deserved in order to be able to access the learning at home that all of our families were now experiencing during this pandemic. And so one of the things that I just really wanna highlight is that Scott is a leader who's committed. He's committed to getting to the right answer. He's committed to having the hard conversations to get there. He's committed to putting his leadership on the line in order to make that possible. Um, and that has just made such a difference for kids. And he's someone that you always know that you can call on when the decisions might be heavy. Um, and I've appreciated that as the board chair of LEARN, the new school selected by the parent to the Ward 8 post. And so I just wanna say to Scott, thank you. Um, not only have I valued the work that you've done for my city, but I respect you immensely as a leader. And I, you know, I don't say that lightly. Um, and so I really wanna say thank you for all of your time with the PCSB and with our, with DC. Thank you, Maya. Terry Golden, I see you there. And uh, if you'd like to say a few words. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm uh, the chairman of KIPP DC and have been the chairman for a little over 12 years. And I was also at the birth of uh, the charter school movement when the federal government and a fellow by the name of Boehner, uh, who was a Republican, by the way, uh, uh, did the leg legislation at the federal level to, to get the charter schools there. Uh, before I speak about Scott, the one thing I really wanted to do is to thank the Public Charter School Board, its directors and staff for a wonderful job that they're doing. You know, we don't as uh, charter uh, people uh, spend enough time really thanking uh, thanking you for the role that you, you take in our lives and uh, the things that you've been able to accomplish. I mean, to think of uh, having now 43,000 people, uh, 43,000 young children in our charter school system is, a, is an amazing uh, achievement. Uh, the focus you've had on at-risk children and, and uh, uh, the focus that you've had on high-performing schools now that we have uh, 23,000 tier one schools, which I find to be a, an amazing number in itself. So uh, quite a, a number of accomplishments that have been done and uh, not enough thank yous uh, uh, for uh, the hard work that's gone in, in that regard. Uh, as far as Scott is concerned, I, uh, I don't wanna forget him. I'd like to ha thank him for so many things. Uh, first of all, for eight and a half years of outstanding leadership uh, on the board. Uh, for us, uh, yeah, the things that we admire about uh, Scott, uh, one is his accessibility, always being there, being willing to listen, always having a point of view, having some strong points of view, but things that we really uh, believed in, it, in uh, what he had to say. He was a good listener. He was consistent and predictable, uh, and he was always moving in the right, right direction. He had an untiring focus on performance. And if you look at the charter schools today, there's very few low performer, performers in the portfolio, and that's not an accident. Uh, he, he felt that for everybody that there was always room for growth, that we could do better. And he was very commended uh, to high expectations and uh, achieving them. Uh, I, and I also appreciated the fact that he really gave a priority to meeting the needs of those special with special needs whether they be mental health or or other he was uh, always on their side and always uh, pushing for more uh, scott is an all-star he's a real uh, achiever and I, I just look forward to seeing what he's doing next we have to all thank him in the uh, charter uh, community for a job really well done we also i have to say uh, look forward to uh, meeting and working with dr walker davis and uh, the charter board in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Terry. Um, I believe Abby Smith is next, um, but I don't see her on. Abby, are you there? 
All right, then I will jump over to uh, Jacques. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate you. Um, wow. When I, I first was given the opportunity to, to speak about Scott, I didn't really, you know, know what I was going to say. I know I've gotten the opportunity to work with him in such close capacities and different capacities, but I wanted to make sure that I said something that truly speaks to the relationship that I've had with him. And then we unfortunately had the passing of Congressman John Lewis and the word that kept coming up and in my mind was he kept telling exonerating people to get into good trouble. And so as I thought about Scott and I thought about what I wanted to say to him, I just wanted to tell him that I appreciate him willing to get into good trouble um, for kids um, east of the river and disadvantaged communities to be willing to step in and really fight for those kids. I, I really remember the very first time that I got to see Scott get into a little good trouble. It was at a Ward 7 meeting and, um, you know, they were being tough on him and he, he held his ground and, you know, on, on a lot of the questions, you know, but he was a little bit more reserved. And then fast forward years later, and he came to a Ward 8 meeting, was, ju was just as contentious. And he went around the room and he spoke to every single person. He knew every single person's name. Um, he talked to their particular issues. Um, he had just really took the time, you could see his growth of learning people and their issues and why they cared about them and meeting them where they were and just improving the relationships that the PCSB had with communities. And that's the type of good trouble that you want to get into when you're um, an executive uh, there at the PCSB and you have to defend all the things that you want to do for kids that are not being served very well by their schools. So I want to say, Scott, I, I so appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate just some of the mentorship that you gave me because there were times when I could call on you and just ask you questions and you would give me answers. You could tell me where we were a little off-centered from something when I was doing it. And I've done it from different positions. I've done it from as an ANC being on the opposite side where I kind of like was going at them and everything. I've done it as the regional director of Rocket Ship. And I was trying to stand up a school that was getting a lot of heat from a community. And he was there for me. And I've done it with uh, Kip DC as their chief community engagement and growth officer. So um, Scott, I just want to tell you, thank you for every part of my growth. Um, you grew with me and you helped me and you are a great friend. And you have set this uh, board on, a, on a, a level and a trajectory that just is phenomenal. And, it just serves so many children and it's children that I live and see every single day. And I appreciate you. So thank you so much, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, Abby Smith, I think you're, you're, I see you now. Hello. How are you all? It's so good to see all of these faces. Um, and I am thrilled to be able to take a minute or two to celebrate Scott. Um, I was actually, when, when I, I got the note that, that this was gonna be happening, I opened up my email to find the very first email exchange that I ever had with Scott, which was eight years ago this week. Um, and it, that was back when we first had a conversation about, um, uh, what did we end up calling it? Your charters, your choice. Um, where we had the very, very, very lofty goal of trying to get everybody to agree to a single deadline for the applications to charter schools, um, which seemed like such a mountain to climb. And Scott reached out and said, I'm really committed to doing this. Now, of course, Scott was a huge leader in moving forward to much more dramatic coordination among charter schools and across um, charter schools and DCPS. Um, but that was, that was the first moment that I talked to Scott. And, and from the beginning, it was clear that this was someone who was determined to to accelerate change in ways that we're going to help kids and families. Um, so I really had the pleasure of working with Scott over the years in a number of different capacities, um, including as deputy mayor, where Jacques, I think some of the things that you just shared resonate with me, where Scott and I weren't always on the same side of every issue, um, but always um, I knew that this was someone who I could be candid with, I could count on him to be candid with me, um, sometimes in more colorful ways than others, um, but knowing that I was gonna always get the, the very best advocacy that he could possibly deliver 
Uh, and then in, in the last couple of years, I had the chance to interact with Scott in a really different situation where he participated as a fellow in the seating disruption program um, that, that I, I co-run with Michelle Molitor. And again, Scott put himself in a position where he was determined to, to push himself and learn and to really show up and, and speak his truth, even when sometimes they're um, he was on a different page with other folks. Um, and it's something that I just deeply, deeply respect about you, Scott. Um, you know who you are and you are eager to learn and, and change and develop, but you also are going to speak your mind. And it's something that I think we all have learned an immense amount from. So I will certainly be sad to see you move out of this role, um, but really excited to see where you go from here and um, and look forward to continuing to to connect in years to come. Thanks, Abby. Erica Bryant. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Erica Bryant and I'm the executive director of the Elsie Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School. We've just completed our 22nd year of educating children in the District of Columbia. I've worked for the school for 17 years and have served as its executive director for seven of those years. During my tenure as executive director of Stokes School, we've experienced a tremendous amount of change. Our demographics have changed as the district's population has changed. We've also grown from being a one campus to a two campus school. During that same period, we've also seen quite a few changes at the DC Public Charter School Board changes in the organizational structure as well as the staff. Um, but one of the constants at PCSB for the past several years has been Scott Pearson. I remember meeting Scott for the first time when I assumed the role of executive director. He was making his rounds to all of the charter schools at the beginning of the school year. I wasn't quite sure what to expect from the meeting but I remember feeling a tremendous sense of relief once it was over because I genuinely believe that Scott's goal was to support me as a school leader and to support Stokes School in our work of educating our students. And for me and our school, Scott's support has remained constant. There are many examples that I could cite, um, but I'll talk about one in particular. Um, in 2015-16, when I began to have uh, thoughts about opening a second campus, I talked with Scott a few times about the process. It was still early in my tenure as executive director. Our school was also in the early stages of applying for our IB authorization. I ultimately decided that year that I didn't want to embark upon another huge project so I decided to wait. But the following year, when I was a little more settled in my role, our school had made good progress with our IB application and our waiting list had in excess of 1500 students. I decided it might be a good time to start planning to replicate and open that second campus. I reached out to Scott to inform him of my decision and he proceeded to connect me with a network of people and organizations that would make it possible for us to acquire sufficient funding and technical assistance to plan, recruit staff, and eventually find the perfect facility to house our second campus, which is now open, located in Ward 7, and about to enter its third year. It would have been much more difficult to open that East End campus without Scott's support, and for that, I will be forever grateful to him. Scott, your work to improve educational outcomes for children in the District of Columbia has been tremendous. I am especially grateful for your leadership and support of charters in the last four months during the time of COVID-19. You've been a steady rock during turbulent times. On behalf of the staff and leadership at Stokes School, I thank you for your dedication to the cause and your unwavering support of our school community. We wish you the best in your future endeavors and hope that you maintain your connections with the education sector in Washington, DC. 
Thank you so much, and we appreciate you. Thanks, Erica. Now, if I could call on uh, Laura Maces. Good evening. I'm Laura Maestas, and I'm the CEO of DC Prep. Some months ago, my cell phone rang on a Sunday afternoon, and when I picked it up, I saw that it was Scott calling. I may or may not have groaned. Your authorizer calling you on a Sunday afternoon is probably not calling with great news. Um, but when I answered, the news was worse than I thought. Scott was calling to let me know that he would be transitioning out of the PCSB. Scott, we will miss you terribly. And you have made us immeasurably better for the time that you've led the PCSB. From the first time that we met, which when I was still living in another city and working at another charter network in New York City, and you proceeded to grill me on our backfilling policies, you have shown me um, and Emily before me that you are always going to fight for kids. I love that about you. You are unapologetic about naming the ways in which our sector can do better. And for the many ways in which you remind us that the bar is the bar is the bar for all kids, because that's what kids deserve, I always know that you will do everything in your power to help us to meet that bar. As a sector, you are outstanding um, at, as a sector leader, you are outstanding at sharing information, at responding to feedback, and at finding ways to streamline the necessary requirements to make sure that you're really focused on like the, the spirit behind what you ask of us. You root everything that you and the PCSB does in a why, and you never forget that charters exist to innovate. And on a personal level, you make what is necessarily hard work easier. I know that I can always count on you to take my call, to offer advice, to give me a straight answer, and when needed, a pep talk. Thank you. And while I was hoping that, like, you know, maybe in this mess of a thing that COVID-19 has brought us, um, that there would be an unexpected silver lining of forcing Scott to stay for another, you know, three or four years, um, today is here. And Scott, please remember that while you may be moving on from this role, you'll always be part of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. We can ask Daniela Anello, who I see. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. This year will mark my 12th year working at DC Bilingual and my sixth year as head of school. I have come a long way since starting in the role of head of school, and for so much of my progress, I credit Scott. As executive director of the Public Charter School Board, Scott supported me and my school through some significant growing pains, including a divorce from our management company, physically moving two campuses to one larger campus, and learning how to observe and successfully welcome students and families from a closing charter school. Regardless of the hour or the day of the week, Scott is quick to respond to an email, a text, or a call. He always finds a way to lend a hand with whatever issue we, as school leaders, face. That very year that we consolidated two campuses into a larger, different campus, Scott arrived with his staff and his son Jasper to work alongside my staff to prepare the school building for the start of the new year. Scott moved box after box, he scrubbed paint off of wooden benches and even made his son clean out our school's outdoor fish pond, which at the time was incredibly filthy and included one lonely fish that nobody even knew was there under the muck. We named him El Campeon. Scott has rooted for me and my school's success through every milestone our school has faced. Even now, during his last few days at the Public Charter School Board, Scott has not skipped a beat in providing us his utmost support. And as DC Bilingual looks to expand to serve more students, and as he supports all of the school, schools to figure out how to reopen their sc the schools in the safest and best way possible. At DC Bilingual, we teach our students what it means to be a leader. Leading at DC Bilingual means learning languages, earning respect, acting responsibly, responsibly, and doing your best. To me, Scott exemplifies the true meaning of what it looks like to lead, and he even speaks Spanish. Thank you, Scott, for your trust, your mentorship, and for being such a strong leader to me during all of your years as Executive Director of the Public Charter School Board. 
you will be greatly missed. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, we're going to give Scott a chance to speak, but it, it wouldn't be um, a reflection on his time without having our longtime deputy director who left us last year, Naomi DeVoe, say a few words to close this out. You have to go off mute. Yeah. Now. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah. Well, you've just heard testaments about how great Scott is at his work, how dedicated he is to the students of DC, to equity, to charter schools, about his focus, his directness, and his integrity. And I'd like to say a few words about how amazing he is as a boss. Every once in a while, life offers you an opportunity that provides you rewards well beyond your wildest expectations. And having the opportunity to work with Scott is at the top of my list of powerful professional experiences. First, some things Scott taught me. Scott taught me how to negotiate. Watching Scott working with others in government and with school leaders and with our board was eye-opening, masterful, and impressive. I would think we were about to give up on a core value, and I'm sure my face showed it all, only to see the conversation swing and an agreement be reached, which benefited everyone. And it was often a little bit of a head whack. And Scott taught me how to look for patterns. Scott puts together the pieces quickly and creates an action plan during the time that the rest of us are just wrapping our heads around what the issue even is. No matter what oversight systems and processes we had in place, Sometimes they were things that fell outside or between the cracks. And inevitably, Scott would uncover them. And well before the rest of us knew what was happening, he would have gone through spreadsheets and documents and records and phone calls and pieced together the scenario. And I remember one issue in particular, that by the end of a board meeting, from the beginning of the board meeting to the end, he had put all the pieces together and created a plan while I was still on step one trying to figure out what happened. Scott tried to teach me to focus on the big issues and not sweat the small stuff. This particular lesson I never fully mastered because I always worried about everything. And Scott let me know how annoying that was. And he focuses, but he focuses on the rocks and the big heavy levers that when adjusted would result in better quality schools. And he stopped the PCSB from getting sidetracked by the many distracting and shiny issues that came our way. So what was important to Scott? that every 11th grader in a DC public charter school see Hamilton when it came to DC, that every charter school be matched with a school nurse, that every family had open access to a fair lottery and could re-enroll, that every staff member had what they needed to be happy at work, including a shower in the bathroom in case you wanted to ride your bike to work. Scott has the best Halloween costumes ever. Scott can dance, don't challenge him to a dance competition on Wii. Scott can cook, always entering our Golden Spoon competitions. And finally, and most importantly than all the rest, I found a friend in Scott and Rick, I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> Communication is easy when you have the same Meyer Briggs, um, which Scott and I shared and no one else on our staff did at all. And then later we found out we had seven of the same top strengths and strengths finders too. So for almost eight years, we shared that connection and we shared our families, our old dogs and their passing and our younger dogs and our children and their loving baseball in the opening game and then not wanting to go to opening game anymore and loving soccer and trying track and field and theater and their first relationships and their first breakups and their leaving home. And through all of it, I knew that Scott cared deeply about the movement about the board, about his family, and about our staff, and about me. And I miss not seeing you regularly. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Almost did it. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, the floor is yours. Wow, I'm extremely overwhelmed. Um, I don't think I've ever had an experience quite like this before in my life. So thank you to everybody for the kind words. Um, I don't really wholly feel I deserve them. Um, I have said many times to many people that this job has been the most rewarding professional experience of my life. And so for that reason also, this moment is very emotional for me. 
Charter schools have always been about empowering people to create great schools that meet the needs of families. And is there anything more inspiring than this? The unlocking of human potential is the greatest work any of us can engage in. And in charter schools, we found a new way to do this at every level, from the students we serve to the more than 600 school board members who are now engaged in supporting public education in Washington. Charter schools have always been about the what and the how. The what, of course, is creating excellent and unique schools. Schools who allow families to find a place that's the right fit for them, who innovate to produce better and more equitable results and who transform communities. But the how is just as important. Charter schools allow extraordinary individuals, many of whom would never dream of working in a large education bureaucracy to participate in the great civic endeavor of public education. And a good authorizer, through a focus on outcomes paired with maximum freedom for how those outcomes are achieved, allows innovation and diversity, choice and excellence to thrive in public education. That has always been the promise of public charter schools, but when we're around the country, we see that promise has too often been unfulfilled. Schools underperform, they find ways to be selective, they steal money, they fail to serve all students. And often the underlying cause of this failure is an authorizer who's too lax on quality, who deprives schools of essential freedoms, or who ignores proper oversight. And when I took this job, I was determined to lead an authorizer that allowed charter schools to fulfill their promise who found ways to respect school autonomy while ensuring proper oversight, and who found ways to show that charter schools can be a, a constructive and collaborative part of civic life. I believe that for the most part, we have succeeded. By almost every measurable dimension, our schools have become higher quality and more equitable over the past eight years. We've deepened our collaboration with DC Public Schools, launching a common lottery, a joint enrollment fair, and a joint recruiting fair this year. We've gone from ignoring city agencies to engaging deeply with them, working together on more than 30 task forces and working groups. And in the process, we've helped make our city stronger and better able to serve all of its residents. With that said, there is so much more to be done. We have narrowed the achievement gap, but it remains far too large. Our work has always been premised on the firm belief that Black Lives Matter but we still have so far to go to make that aspiration a reality. Part of my decision to step down was a recognition that maybe I've carried things forward as far as I am able. And what is needed are new perspectives, new ideas, and new energy to sustain that progress. And in Dr. Michelle Walker Davis, I believe that our board has found a leader to do just that. Of course, I plan to step down long before coronavirus, and with this pandemic, the challenges before the Charter Board have doubled, as they have for our schools and for virtually every other institution across the globe. The savage inequities in who is affected and who is dying of this virus only reinforce our obligation to offer schools that are both equitable and excellent. I leave this job with so much gratitude, starting with my deepest thanks to you, our volunteer board members, who've given so much to our community and to me. And I'm particularly grateful to the board chairs who I've served under, Rick Cruz, Darren Woodruff, Skip McCoy, and Brian Jones, each of whom has been an invaluable source of support, of helpful criticism, and of the kind of thought partnership that is essential to reaching good decisions. I'm so grateful to our school leaders and their staffs and their boards because they are the ones who are really doing the hard work every day. And they, more than anyone, have been the source of inspiration and energy to me. I made it a practice to start many of my work days with a school visit and the joy from those visits powered me on for the rest of the day. I wanna thank the city's leadership, including Mayor Bowser and before her, Mayor Gray and the city council particularly Council Chair Phil Mendelson and Education Committee Chair David Grasso. We haven't agreed on everything, but their core support for our schools and their funding has been invaluable. 
and our progress would not have been possible without the partnership of Hansul Kang at ASI, the leadership at DCPS, including Kaya Henderson and Louis Faraby, and the deputy mayors for education, particularly Abby Smith, Jenny Niles, and Paul Kine. And finally, I want to thank our staff. I think you've heard in some of the things that people have said how much I have grown in the past eight years as a leader and as a person. And much of that growth has be been because of the feedback that I've gotten from our staff. That feedback wasn't always easy to hear, but it was a gift. And I have truly loved the opportunity to work with our staff, such a smart and committed and talented group. And most of all, I wanna thank our senior team, Lenora, Tamika, Rashida, and Sarah, and from the past, Clara, Theola, Nicole, and most especially Naomi. This job has truly been a team effort. I thank you for your wisdom, your friendship, your high standards, your excellent work, your willingness to tell me when I'm wrong, and most of all, your ability to make me laugh. Without you, this job may have been impossible and it certainly would have been a lot less fun. I have to admit feeling a little guilty stepping aside in this moment of crisis, but I leave optimistic in the future with confidence in this board, in the PCSB staff, and in Dr. Walker Davis. And I pledge to stay engaged on behalf of public charter schools in Washington and to support you in any way that I can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, this, may, this may feel a little bit um, sort of uh, unusual to be doing via Zoom, but um, we do want to take this moment to present you with the board's award for exceptional service. And for those unfamiliar with the award, it recognizes an employee who has significantly furthered the goals and mission of the DC Public Charter School Board through his or her uh, sustained commitment to providing outstanding service to the agency. So in recognition of and appreciation for your significant contributions to the DC PCSB, we present you with our highest award. And I'll read the proclamation. You'll, you'll get the, um, the wonderful uh, award in the mail. Whereas from 2012 to 2020, Scott Pearson's tenure as a devoted executive director helped to ensure the DC Public Charter School Board could fulfill its mission of providing quality public charter school options to students and families in Washington, DC. And whereas Scott's commitment to ensuring DC, DC's public charter schools provide every student a quality education while holding the schools to a high academic standard. And whereas Scott led the charge to raise the charter sector's academic performance through expanding DCPCSB's accountability tool, the performance management framework, closing 41 low performing schools and approving 24 new campuses of existing high performing schools. And whereas Scott ensured the board put its ultimate stakeholders first, the families and students served by our public charter schools by empowering them with more transparent data about public charter schools. And now therefore be it resolved that the DC Public Charter School Board does hereby honor Scott Pearson for his tireless efforts on behalf of Washington DC students and their families, awarding him our highest honor, the DC Public Charter School Board's Award for Exceptional Service. Thank you, Scott. And we all look forward to staying in touch, uh, certainly through the duration of this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. I'm extremely grateful for all of your remarks and, um, and for your friendship. Thank you. So we will now turn to our agenda for the evening. So for those of you, I assume all the old board members want to stick with it just for old time's sake uh, and shadow all of the, uh, the public hearing and, award and, and votes. But um, as with our virtual meetings, uh, as we move through each agenda item, Briani, our moderator for the evening, will unmute DCPCSB staff or individuals speaking on behalf of the school. The hand raising feature has been disabled and individuals who previously signed up to testify will be called upon. And as a reminder, all written public comment is available to the uh, public on our website. And if you didn't sign up by sending your name to Briani before this meeting, please submit your comments to public.comment at dcpcsb.org or call our public comment line to leave a voicemail testimony at 202-963-0949. I'm going to begin with uh, calling public witnesses uh, to um, provide their testimony. And I'll ask that you each keep your public comments to two minutes. 
and I'm be going to begin this evening first with Candace Davis. Uh, Briani, if you would um, unmute Ms. Davis's line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, this is Candace Davis, and I am with Ayana Belguda advocating for at-risk students who are being neglected by an accountability system that intentionally has minimal authority, which gives corrupt school leaders an opportunity to financially benefit while students and teachers suffer. According to research, an at-risk student has a high chance of failing due to several home life factors, including poverty and exposure to danger, harm, and or loss. Everyone knows that risk students require more social, emotional, and academic support than their more privileged peers within affluent communities. More specifically, at-risk students need intense and ongoing mental health assessments, monitoring, and care. However, there is a serious problem with the intentional avoidance of this matter by school leaders, and there's a lack of effective oversight from this board. Enrollment doesn't matter in an at-risk elementary school when we know parents have to send their kids to school, and they have very few school choices because all the schools in the community typically have the same problems as it relates to special education, behavior, and safety. Academic achievement doesn't matter when standards are significantly low, assessments are developmentally developmentally inappropriate, and the 30% performing at grade level, if the data has not been manipulated, are the students who are more than likely not at risk. School leaders should not be rewarded for providing an attractive building with food and technology while drilling and killing basic skills. The real work includes a thorough data analysis, quantitative and qualitative, of each and every student, which will expose the complex and diverse needs of at-risk children. Such needs might include, but not limited to, sufficient and qualified staff that specializes in restorative practices, crisis management, differentiated instruction, therapy, life skills, and individualized instruction, alternative schedules, alternative settings, and more. Yes, this is a lot, and it may be expensive, but it's what our students need. More than anything, however, our students just want to feel loved and protected like all students. In this case, the best way to evaluate a school leader's disposition towards children should be based on how well he or she knows the students being served. If school leaders were required by this board to provide accurate and comprehensive data about all students, they will either work to meet the needs of all students or not. And if not, the board should revoke the school's charter because students' lives are still at risk right now today. I would like Ayana to continue from here. Thank you. Ms. Belguda. Hello. Yes. Okay. This is Ayana Belguda. Um, after serving as vice principal at Ingenuity Prep Public Charter School, we are confident that the lack of qualified staff and unethical practices are direct indicators to the lack of support provided to IP's at-risk population, which reflects either leadership's lack of understanding of IP's community, their lack of ability to meet students' needs, or the lack of care for students and teachers. However, the bigger problem is our experiment, our experience has not been accurately verified or evaluated because your current level of oversight in the performance management framework does not properly include mental health, social, emotional learning, school culture and climate, teacher retention, or any factors contributing to specific needs of at-risk students. This is why we cannot get anyone to help us protect IP students. Allowing at-risk schools to operate with ineffective oversight is allowing at-risk students to have a higher chance of failure due to multiplied trauma at the hands of school leaders. Therefore, with COVID-19 on everyone's mind, there is no better time than now to not only talk about the needs of at-risk communities, but to require qualified staff, effective mental health support, and academic interventions that can be accurately measured and monitored on a consistent basis. Furthermore, enforcement of such practices must include appropriate consequences that demonstrates the importance of students' mental health and physical safety above anything or anyone else. I'll conclude with the following questions. What is the purpose of labeling communities at risk if attention is not given to the needs of those students and their families? If you are going to treat all schools the same, regardless of student needs, by focusing on enrollment, test scores, and financial management, why are additional funds given per at-risk student. Are schools not required to provide data and specific support with those at-risk funds? If so, how are you monitoring the effectiveness and impact of that support or lack thereof? Thank you. Uh, Rick, do you mind if I ask a question? Um, you know, we've had both, both uh, Ms. Belbuda and, um, I'm sorry, Candace, I'm not recalling your last name at the moment. Davis. Please forgive me, Davis. Um, so, 
in the work that the staff has done to work with you all uh, to address these concerns with not only the staff but the board of the school, uh, you've come to this board in addition to, because it sounds like your recommendation is uh, revocation, what other options, what, what else would you like for this board to consider or what would you recommend that we we do during the pandemic and with school buildings not being open at this time? Brianna, if you could uh, make sure that Ms. They're Davis both allowed to speak. Okay. I'm sorry, I was on mute and didn't realize it. Can you all hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, um, thank you for the question. Um, we've been um, hoping that someone would do a bigger or a deeper dive into the school's data and into the school's actual system. We want someone to actually look at what's happening inside of the paperwork and really go deeper. We, we know for a fact that what we saw and what we experienced at the school has not improved. And so our concern is that the level of audit, auditing that was conducted was not effective. And so because we have continuous reports from teachers and families saying that nothing has improved, we were hoping that someone would go in and look further. So maybe a systems audit versus a desk audit. I'm not really sure exactly what needs to be done because we haven't been there. We don't know exactly the problem. We just know for sure there is a problem and our students are suffering because of it. Understood. And I, I recognize that uh, the need to have a, a deeper dive and look into what's happening is probably necessary. But in, in the moment that we are in at, at this particular time, um, due to the pandemic, school buildings being closed, uh, and students not being in the building at this time, how would you like for this board uh, to, to address your questions and concerns where we're limited in the amount of um, review that we're able to do at this time. Well, I'm assuming that most of the information that the school will provide will be via technology. So we're asking that the school provide you all a thorough turnaround plan that clearly addresses all of the concerns that we have continued to report. So if that, I mean, that can be provided in writing with data that supports it. We also have um, recommended a neutral party to come in and um, do an audit of these things. We're not, I mean, this information, I'm assuming can be sent to you all. We don't have to leave our homes to look at the systems that are in place because it should be documented. In addition to that, though, I want to um, remind everyone that we have already talked about the violations at this school. And if this school has already been found guilty of violations that directly harm students, I'm concerned that we have to continue to beg for what students should naturally deserve. So if there is not a, an opportunity for, the, for you all to look into this school closer, why are we allowing this school to stay open, not knowing whether or not they will properly serve students next fall? So I know that ASI has, um, has done an analysis and um, has reviewed several of the concerns. We know that uh, one of the three concerns has been addressed. Uh, and they are now working to cure and remedy the remaining two. Uh, with, the, with those concerns still being up in the air uh, and recognizing that we wanna make sure that accountability is at the forefront of what we do day in and day out. What you've presented this evening, what you presented last month, what you presented prior to that, I know that uh, myself and other members of this board are uh, concerned. We're continuing to do deep dives into what is happening. Um, and we've also received information directly from the school. But what is it that we can provide to you directly to know that these things have shifted and or have, if the two of you all can provide uh, the parents and families that are concerned about the status of the school and having them come before us with the direct concerns of their, their students. 
Um, those are great questions. Well, the first thing is we, we would like to see this turnaround plan that this school claims to have. We had a conversation with the CEO and the CAO and the board's chair, and we had real questions for them. We prepared carefully for this meeting, excited for the chance to finally move forward, just to find out that they had no answers. And so we still have questions that are unanswered. And the reason we still have questions unanswered is because people continue to report. To your second question, we are in the process of gathering teachers who have finally um, left the school permanently and are looking to other schools so they now feel safe with reporting out. <clears throat> Brianna, did we lose them? Yes, I don't see her anymore. But okay. um Yeah. Looks like they're both gone. Um, so Rick, I we've had conversations directly with the board. Um this board has has heard these concerns, continues to. Um, and we don't diminish the concerns that are being brought up. I, 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 my biggest concern now is um, if parents are suffering in silence and not coming to our board, we, we need to figure out the best way to make sure that we're hearing those direct concerns in terms of like student, um, the so, individual students. So I know Rashida Young is meeting with um, Ayana and Candace later this week. Um, to uh, follow up on their um, related letter. Um, mm -hmm. So we appreciate it to report back to the board what she sees as the appropriate next steps, um, as well as um, what uh, the school, or what, sorry, what PCSP staff will uh, do in the way of monitoring as we reopen um, how, and as uh, Ingenuity Prep reopens uh, to ensure that we um, do take a further look at what their um, what their what the concern how the concerns that have been articulated might present in whatever model the uh, school reopens in at the end of at the end of August. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll continue um, and move into our public hearing. We have a few items open for public hearing uh, this evening. Um, we'll be starting uh, with. Um, Yale Haynes Public Charter School and Melody Sampson, I believe, is joining us to share that item. Hi, everyone. This is Melody Sampson, the Senior Manager of School Quality and Accountability. This is a public hearing to discuss Yale Haynes Public Charter School's proposal to amend its charter agreement by changing its mission statement. The school says its new mission maintains the educational philosophy and spirit of the original mission. The the proposed mission no longer prioritizes math and science. While the school proposes removing the math and science focus in its mission, it does not expect these changes to significantly impact or change the school's math and science curricula. Additionally, the school proposes to adopt updated PMF physicals language in its charter agreement. A representative from the school is available to speak this evening to answer the board's questions. I'm Brianna, can we make sure Hillary will be speaking on behalf of the school? I think you are, uh, you are yes, now she's on. on. Yes. Hi, everyone. Good evening, members of the board, uh, public charter school board staff, and members of the community. First, I want to echo deep appreciation for Scott's leadership. Your from, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, first, uh, uh, from the moment that I took on this role as a new charter leader, um, you have been in tremendous value to me personally, but more importantly, your advocacy and leadership greatly benefited the entire E.L. Haynes community. Thank you, Scott. As Melody shared, uh, E.L. Haynes seeks to formally amend our current charter agreement to reflect our new revised mission. Tonight, I'm here to share a little bit about why we decided to change our mission and how we got there and to answer any of your questions. E.L. Haynes is at an exciting and critical point in our history. We recently celebrated our 15th year of serving DC students and families. And in January 2019, you, the PCSB, unanimously voted to approve our charter for another 15 years. As we looked ahead to the next 15 years, we knew it was really important to pause and reflect on our progress and our identity as a school community, to assess where we have served students and families well, 
and where we needed to change to accomplish our, accomplish our highest aspirations for our students, helping each of them to achieve their own aspirations and goals. We officially launched a new strategic planning process um, in March 2019, and a key outcome of that process is our new revised mission, one that better represents and describes our commitment to our students and our community. I am proud to say that our new strategic plan and our revised mission are based on the voices and perspectives of nearly 400 E.L. Haynes community members, including students, families, staff, and trustees. Through multiple iterations with our staff and our cross-functional working groups, including family members and trustees, we arrived at a draft last fall. Students' voices gave feedback at multiple points in our process, and they helped us finalize the words in the new revised mission. We knew it was important for them to see themselves and their futures in these words. A mission statement articulates the highest level description of why an organization exists, and it affirms what we seek to be. It is why our staff and students show up every day. And for this reason, we thought it was absolutely critical to spend as much time as we did getting the words just right. Ultimately, our new mission, which reads, we are a learning community where every student of every race, socioeconomic status, home language and ability prepares to thrive in college, career and life. Together, we create a more just and kind world. In addition, in addition to being shorter, our new mission reflects our commitment to fight for equity, to always be a diverse and inclusive community that holds every student to high expectations and to prepare every student for college while also honoring all post-secondary choices. A couple of key changes highlighted in PCSB's staff's proposal. First, based on the explicit guidance from our students, we maintained the every student of every race, socioeconomic status, and home language phrase from our original mission. And we intentionally added ability to reflect our commitment to serving our many students with disabilities who are a vital part of our community. You'll see we no longer specifically call out math and science as a singular focus for our students. Because our community felt that by including this in our mission, we overemphasize math and science in a way that suggested E.L. Haynes was a STEM program, which is not reflective of our current instructional program. We believe math and science are key components of our liberal arts program, but not more so than other programs and subjects. We focus on math and science at all three of our schools and will continue to focus on improving and holding students to high standards in their learning in these subjects. Overall, we as a school community are motivated by the future for E.L. Haynes that the new mission outlines for us and we are excited to share the story with you and to formally update our charter agreement to reflect this new mission. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Lori. Board members, any questions at this time? Quick question. Hello, Hillary, how are you? Um, can you walk us through how you've uh, engaged your school community around the change of the um, mission and vision? Yeah, of course. Um, we, we started the process last year um, about March of 2019 when we knew we were um, sort of sunsetting our previous strategic plan and needed a new path for the, the five years ahead. And um, we start, we did a lot of, uh, we used social media to engage our families and larger community as much as possible. We hosted focus groups. We had working groups, um, many working groups across the process. Um, we actually um, had more in my opening remarks, but wanted to be conscious of everyone's time this evening. Um, we started last March um, when we kicked off with everybody with our full staff community with uh, student videos answering questions about places we were strong and places where we were falling short of what they wanted and needed from the school community. And so we have centered student voices in this process and given as many, oppor many opportunities for families to engage as well. Um, everything from obviously the mission, but more importantly, even some of the, the, the decisions that will flow from that. So we've re, uh, we're, we're committing to an aligned program across pre-K-12 and that includes continued curriculum updates and shifts, as well as the learning experiences that our students want over the course of their time um, within our community. And so have lots more to share on that, but I also know <laughs> that wasn't the full extent of your question, Naomi. I just will want to reiterate that there were many opportunities and it was really important for us to have an inclusive process, which is part of also why it took over a year. 
Thank Hillary, uh, this is Jim Sandman. Thank you for your excellent presentation. You anticipated and answered all of my questions. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hillary, I'd just like to ask, um, given the, uh, the, the refinement of the mission and the deletion of math and science, you know, we go back and look at the math performance of um, the middle and high school, and, and there's um, certainly some room for growth. So I'd just love for you to reflect on, on those. While I know it's not, you're not a STEM school, how you think about opportunities there. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Rick. I, you know, there are lots of areas for improvement in our, in our students' performance. It's not just limited to math and science. I think, um, you know, there, there are definitely areas where we're at each campus focusing on ELA and math performance and science performance. I think the interesting uh, difference with science performance is the first year that we had data on science performance of our students um, on a standardized test in this way. And that has given us really important new information for our planning moving forward. I think, um, you know, I, I will always share with the board that we want, we're not happy with where our student performance is overall. And we've had some improvements over the years and we've had some areas where we aren't making the improvement that our students deserve. Um, and that's something our, our teachers and administrators are looking at now as they also plan for how we're going to support our students in the, the year ahead, um, including in a very different kind of uh, school model <laughs> that the data and how our students were performing um, is, is forefront of that for us. Um, but I, I also just want to share there are other parts of the mission that also didn't make it into the new revised mission that are still important to us, including things like active community members or responsible citizens. But those were things that were in our original mission. And we just, uh, the ethos of E.L. Haynes, those live in lots of different areas for us. And we wanted the mission to be the most core and the most central parts of the aspirations we have for our students and the how. Uh, the academic program, the focus they get at each, each grade level, the, the learning experiences that we build in, how we prepare them for, for, for career and life as well, are all a critical part of the ultimate strategic plan as well. They're just not in the, the final words mm -hmm. of, of our new revised mission statement. Thank you, Larry. Board members, any other questions at this time? We won't be voting on this this evening, but at our next uh, at our next scheduled meeting. Um, but it, now's the best time to ask any final questions. All right. Uh, well, Hillary, thank you, and uh, we will certainly follow up if if there are any additional questions. Otherwise, we will vote on this at our next meeting. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next up for um, public uh, hearing is Friendship PCS's program enrollment cap and grade expansion. Uh, and invite Allison. There you are. Good evening. Hi, I'm Allison Waddy, specialist on the School Quality and Accountability Team. This is a public hearing to discuss Friendship Public Charter School's proposal to amend its charter agreement. One, to eliminate the cap on the number of students who can enroll in Friendship Public Charter School, Collegiate Academy's online program. And two, to expand to grades pre-kindergarten three and pre-kindergarten four at Friendship Public Charter School Online Academy. The LEA seeks these adjustments for school year 2020-21. Pertaining to increasing the enrollment cap, Friendship PCS requests to permanently remove the 100 student program enrollment cap increasing the number of available collegiate online seats. The LEA believes the demand for full-time virtual programs will increase due to COVID-19, and the school plans to meet this need by offering additional seats for its online programs. Pertaining to grade expansion, Friendship Online Academy currently serves students in grades kindergarten through eight and seeks to expand grades by adding pre-kindergarten four in school year 2020-21 and pre-kindergarten three in school year 2021-22. The school partners with K-12 Inc., a for-profit education management organization to provide curricula and instruction for the virtual program. The LEA plans to adopt K-12's preschool companion service in BART K-12 Online, a curriculum designed to prepare children for kindergarten. The proposed scheduled school day is 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., with students engaged in synchronous and asynchronous learning activities. 
Students will also receive in-person instruction one day per week at the Physical Friendship PCS Online Academy campus. Representatives from the school are available this evening to answer the board's questions. Allison, thank you. Brianna, can we make sure that the friendship team is unmuted? And if you'd all take a moment to introduce yourselves and if uh, you have some opening remarks before um, what I think are some questions we might have. All right. Hi, Hi good evening. My name is Vielka Scott Marcus and I am the Chief Academic Officer for Friendship Public Charter Schools. Good evening, Ken Cherry, Chief of Staff with Friendship. Monique Miller, Director of Performance Reporting and Evaluation with Friendship Public Charter School. Good evening, my name is Tassia Bagani. I'm the Early Childhood Director for Friendship Public Charter Schools. Good evening, I'm Kimberly Campbell. I am the Strategic Advisor with Friendship Public Charter Schools. My name is Gigi David and I'm the Director of Reggio Inspired Education. Good evening. My name is Tracy Sloan. I am the head of school for uh, Friendship Online. I apologize. I am using my wife's account. We're on vacation and had some difficulties logging in. <laughs> no worries. I'm Nancy Brosnahan. I am the academic administrator for Friendship Online. Hi, I'm Shana Velez. I'm the special education coordinator for Friendship Online. Right. Is that is that everyone rep representing friendship this evening? All right. I Very believe good. so. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so would uh, would anyone like to open with some uh, remarks or comments before uh, we have some questions? Yes. Good evening, everyone. I would like to start by giving thanks for Mr. Pearson's leadership and your thought partnership with Friendship PCS over the years. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you about our request to serve pre-kindergarten students using the Embark K-12 curricula and to lift the enrollment cap for the Friendship Collegiate Online Academy. Both amendments are critical as families seek virtual options and Friendship is committed and has the capacity to provide them. As you know, Friendship PCS just completed its 22nd year of operation and is authorized to serve students in grades pre-K three through 12. These requests do not require a material change to our charter. Our mission and goals do not change. In fact, our enrollment ceiling does not change. Timing is critical as the challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic make virtual options essential for families in the District of Columbia for the 2020-21 school year, beginning in less than a month. So there is an urgent need we are facing. As it relates to serving pre-K at Friendship Online, Friendship and K-12 have been discussing serving pre-K students for a year and believe that we are ready to move forward. Since acquiring the Friendship Online campus in school year 2015-16, Friendship PCS and K-12 have developed a strong partnership and understand better what the other offers. Friendship PCS has a proven track record of success according to our PMF performance at our elementary campuses and our class results. Friendship's LEA class domain score averages met or exceeded tier one standards for the last two years. Moreover, our most recent PMF data show that we exceed the PMF targets for all class domains in school year 2018-19. K-12 is a national leader in virtual education and our Friendship Online campus exceeds the state and charter sector averages for students scoring four plus on park in ELA and just below the charter sector in math. With regard to eliminating the enrollment cap for the online program within the Collegiate Academy campus, we request that you allow us to enroll students within our long approved enrollment ceiling of 5,115 without constraining the enrollment of a specific program within a campus. Families are concerned about returning to school as well as we all are. 
Friendship would like to be able to offer our high school online academy more broadly without the fear of turning families away because of this cap. We welcome any questions you have and hope that you vote affirmatively when the time comes for your decision. At this time, we have a parent, Ms. Madeline Palmer, whose third, fifth, and new kindergarten student attend Friendship Online. Ms. Palmer would like to provide comments in support of the pre-K expansion at Friendship Online. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brianna, can you make sure that Ms. Palmer is unmuted? She's not online. Okay, she well, did. we can. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. She did provide a statement for me. I guess she wasn't able to stay on. If you'd like me to read the statement that she provided, I'd be happy to do so. That would be great, thank you. All right, give me just a second to pull it up here. Um, her name is Madeline Palmer. She said, when we were considering an educational option for our girls, we needed a program that would allow personal growth while complying with DCPS guidelines. Finding the perfect public school with a focus on higher education at a young age seemed impossible. We found ourselves supplementing their growth with programs like ABC Mouth, Your Baby Can Read, and random free apps, while accessing different support groups and other seasoned parents focused on helping their kids to be more self-sufficient. Adding a pre-K program will give parents a wider range of valid resources and options that will help immerse younger students earlier. It will help nurture the learning of a student while opening the doors toward a larger range of exploration. This will also build the initial confidence for both parent and child. Online education will only work if everyone is on board. Having an option that gradually introduces new concepts will open the doors to explore, learn, and be excited as they develop into the individuals we all know they can be. All in all, a centralized system that will help build on your child's capabilities is much better than winging it. This addition will benefit the entire program as they experience personal growth. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I'm gonna open it up to the board for uh, any questions that they have. I'd just like to um, acknowledge uh, Friendship's request for an expedited vote. Um, so we uh, believe we are looking at uh, noticing a special meeting next week so that you all um, know the outcome uh, of the vote uh, in advance of um, school. I know school planning is already underway, but in a more advanced notice than we would if uh, we waited until August or September. Right. Board member. Get off. Oh. Um, Leah? Yeah, thank you so much for these presentations and for um, reading the, that testimony just now. I'm curious for whoever on the school team can best share some evidence of demand beyond this parent um, for virtual early childhood programming and um, to what extent you can also predict demand that may sustain on the other side of this pandemic. Hi, it's Tracy Sloan again. Um, <clears throat> we have had a, a long list of requests for us to look into the pre-K option for our families. Uh, each week on uh, Thursdays, we meet for a blended learning day and our learning coaches stay and we have professional development and activities to help develop the learning coaches. Uh, they do panel questions and each year it's one of the most talked about topics for our, our families. Uh, Prior to that, it was the high school option for our middle school families that was the number one talked about uh, question or, or guidance that they gave us. Uh, this year and last year and the year before, uh, it, it's certainly been the pre-K option for their students and, and why we don't have that available to them. Leah, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. It's so, so it sounds like it has come up in, there's anecdotal evidence that it's come up in before COVID started, is that right? Yes, that is correct. Uh, for about the last three years, it's been the, the most 
talked about uh, topic with our learning coaches and parents during these learning coach sessions. Is, is it your, what do you attribute it to? Are these from parents who don't currently enroll their child at, in the school or is this from parents with siblings that are older that would yes. appreciate having younger siblings attend as well? So the, yes, the, the, the parents have siblings in the school but have younger siblings that uh, either they're homeschooling or they're looking for another pre-K option and have them enrolled in a traditional or traditional pre-K school that they're not particularly happy with. Um, as in Ms. Palmer, who sent the statement to uh, Mrs. Brosnahan, uh, she has a kindergarten student now and she did not have the option to have uh, a, a friendship online pre-K experience. Uh, we have numerous families that are in that situation currently. Thank you. I'll, I have follow-up questions, but I'll yield my space to another board member. Steve, I think you were going to ask a question. Well, uh, I'm gonna go on to another topic. So Leah, why don't you finish your, your questions, Leah? Okay, I thank you, I appreciate it. I, I'm, I'm just curious from um, what evidence you found to, aside from anything authored by, by this company K-12, that demonstrates that virtual instruction for very young children yields high academic and socio-emotional um, res results? So K-12 conducted two studies, two separate studies using the Embark curriculum. And um, in, in both of the studies, although they were small scale studies, both studies revealed that students um, were better prepared for kindergarten student using kindergarten to prepare them for kindergarten using the Embark curriculum. I believe that we sent that information to the staff, I, I believe, and the studies. Sure, sure. And that's why I was, I was wondering what evidence you may have of, uh, of reports beyond that which may have been authored by K-12. Uh, that is uh, the report that the, the studies that we were going off of. The um, <clears throat> The curriculum and the online nature of it is not new. Uh, it's currently being used in eight states and multiple other charter schools and private partnerships currently. And we have not um, found any other um, studies that speak to um, the the efficacy of online instruction or um, its appropriateness so we are um, basing um, this application based on what our parents have expressed that they want and what they need and infusing and working with um, k-12 to make sure that the developmentally appropriate aspects of um, the online virtual instruction um, is a part of that that program. So our um, early childhood directors, Nancy and Tracy, will be working together, um, infusing some of our Reggio-inspired um, approaches, as well as um, providing um, some class training to the uh, K-12 early childhood staff and their learning coaches um, to, to ensure that those best practices that we know work in a brick and mortar um, are translated to a virtual, um, a virtual setting. Um, we will be working on evaluating, um, you know, as soon as we have the opportunity to, um, um, to, to look at the efficacy of what we're doing. So it, I think this, this virtual space um, as it relates to pre-K is new for a lot of um, school districts um, across the globe. And um, this is, you know, an opportunity for us 
to, to do this, um, you know, as we said, it is something that we've been thinking about and talking about for a year. And we do want to make sure that we do this right, which is why, you know, we are engaging in this co-planning to do it. I'm, if now is an appropriate time to hear, to elaborate a bit more on what this actually looks like in practice. I think I'm probably not alone in being interested in hearing what that sounds like. I'm a parent of two small children and I'm, <laughs> it's hard to imagine how this could work. And, and so I just appreciate hearing more. So yeah, Nancy, so do you want to, oh, And sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Miller, but mm -hmm. I, I think you might also appreciate why some people might be skeptical that research conducted by a for-profit company confirming the efficacy of its model with a small sample size might be met with some skepticism. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a lot to dig into here, particularly when we were talking about this in a post-COVID era. We understand we're all building the plane as we're flying it in this upcoming school year, but you know, I, I have the same sorts of concerns and questions that Leah has about the efficacy of an online program for three and four year olds that most of the research, uh, you know, I don't pretend to be an early childhood expert, but in, in reading about distance learning this past spring, much of the emerging research suggests that it didn't work very well for uh, the, the younger students who were, who were building uh, skills as opposed to building upon content knowledge. And I, and I also really think we should drill into the, the for-profit component of the organization running this. So if you could dig in a little bit on those um, pieces, I would appreciate it. Sure, so Nancy and Tracy, do you want to start with, um, or Gigi? I, I saw that Gigi, you were about to jump in. Yes, I, I was just going to speak to, um, we've been uh, implementing some very effective uh, virtual learning with our parents currently. Um, we did in the spring and we are now in the summer. And so we are um, connecting with our parents on a regular basis, providing at-home activities for them to do with clear um, directions that are very developmentally appropriate and providing materials for them to use as well. Could you give an, like a, I'm actually genuinely interested in this. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but could you walk us through a specific example of how this works with a three-year-old? So right now we're working with, um, with the pre-kindergarten children. And, um, and so, for example, they're, they're learning about spatial reasoning. And so an example of an activity that works with the parents, where the parents can understand, be involved, and provide um, a high quality experience, they um, were learning positional vocabulary and were asked to create an obstacle course in their home and give children uh, directions using positional vocabulary for the children to practice these skills. Um, so th they've actually been working on basic concept knowledge throughout the summer and having um, all kinds of experiences related to that in terms of um, learning about, um, you know, concepts in number and concepts in literacy, learning about um, just a variety of, of concepts that are needed for kindergarten. And, um, and we've provided uh, the materials and the um, directions and also a webinar for parents to become familiar with materials and to use them um, you know, in a developmentally appropriate way and also meeting with the, the classroom teacher on a regular basis once a week um, with other parents um, to support each other in this process. Thank you. I'd like to talk a little bit about our program. Um, and I, I just want to start by saying uh, hello to Scott Pearson. Scott, um, congratulations on, on everything that you've done. And Tracy and I had the pleasure of meeting with Scott when we became one of the campuses uh, of friendship. And he came over to us, sat down with us, uh, looked at how we do what we do. Uh, and he was just, it was really great to see him take such an active interest uh, in our program. Uh, and it's something that we've been, been very proud to grow in the district for, for many years now. Um, one of the, the, the wonderful things about the MBARC program is that it 
very closely matches up to the program that we use for our kindergarten through fifth grade students. Um, so the, the MBARC curriculum is very much in line with the way our kindergarten students, our first grade, our second grade students log in and work in activities. K-12 does provide all of the materials that are needed and all these lessons. The lessons are very interactive. They, uh, they are thematically based units and the teacher helps the students in an online live session uh, during the day, um, as well as helps to support the learning coach to help them to understand how to bring these lessons to life at home and to how to work with the lessons and the student at the same time. I know there's gonna be lots of questions, so. <laughs> uh, my, I, I do have a question, but it's not in follow up to what you just laid out, but okay. to, the, to the staff in terms of the, the interest that parents have demonstrated, have you received any pushback from this, uh, this recommendation at all? Have you all, just to get a little more color around what um, concerns families have, with this proposal? Tracy or Nancy? I mean, we, I have No, we've only heard requests. Um, we, you know, and I go through the process of talking with new families um, and that have enrolled every single year as I do uh, some learning coach orientation sessions. And mostly parents are just asking, you know, do you have pre-K available? When will you have pre-K available? It is definitely something that we've not, had any pushback, it's only, it's only requests. Thank you. So I want to add to that as well by saying that this is a virtual program, but we also integrate in-person interaction for our existing students. And that is also the plan for the students in the pre-K program. So I think that that is something that's very critical. Um, that support is provided for both parents as learning coaches, as well as students who need additional support. Um, with regard and going back to the previous question about the for-profit nature of K-12, um, we have not found any issues with the for-profit nature of K-12. Um, what we have is a partnership that really is about working together to meet the mission and vision of Friendship Public Charter School. And so as Friendship sees that the pre-K to eight model has been successful across its other campuses, we also see that this has great potential for our online campus. Um, we know that um, for our early learners, that social emotional support and learning is critical. Um, I can tell you that some examples of the experiences with students this year were just joyful activities um, in dealing with COVID-19 and setting up a museum and a highly interactive program where we had a video that had a demonstration for students and parents to participate in our online museum. Our Reggio folks have been very invested in supplementing the Embark program with those types of experiences. Um, so it, 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 it really is something that we have thought about in terms of how we supplement Embark to make it a friendship public charter school early childhood program. And I think that I just wanna add that in the spring, during COVID, we really worked hard to develop something that met the social emotional needs of children and families and the academic needs of them. So on a daily basis, we had a social emotional check-in for families and for children. And they came together and they sang songs and teachers would do a check-in with families to see how things were going. Did they need support? And then they would bring that information back to us um, with a weekly check-in, we would try to intervene where we needed to, and then students would have a read aloud where the teacher would either have the book or, you know, use a YouTube version or a virtual version of the book, and the students would be very excited and very engaged, and the teacher would ask, you know, a variety of questions, um, engage in, you know, wonderful conversation, or, you know, if there was something going on in the book, 
well, let's take two minutes and find something in your home that represents X. And they would bring it back um, and they would talk about it. And then, you know, we log off for a little while, have an activity that would happen in the home, as Gigi alluded to, um, and then come back, do some numeracy, um, do some fun activities. I know that we had teachers that would sometimes do um, a dance party, you know, but rooted in skills. And so, I mean, there were a number of things um, that we tried to do. And as Ms. Campbell alluded to, we did a friendship-wide gratitude project um, for just everyone, but it really started as an early childhood thing. Um, and we investigated, what does it mean to be me? What does it mean to live in a community? Um, what does it mean to show gratitude? And how do I show gratitude? And I mean, the conversations and the work that came out of that encompassed just so many um, different standards if we just think about it in that way. But I think the deep level of community that people developed with the mailman or with the garbage collector, I think it um, sort of accentuates the spirit of social emotional development, um, social studies, bridging, um, you know, all sorts of divides, especially during this time. So I think that if we are creative and we work hard, we can meet children um, where they need to be met. I've got a four-year-old at home, so I understand that there are some things that will be difficult, but um, we are a team that is committed to being creative um, and to making it work for our children. Thank you for that. I, I'm, are there any members of the friendship um, board on this call tonight? I'm, I'm curious to understand if within the friendship community there had been a consideration of implementing or undergoing some kind of pilot. Um, because as my colleague Steve mentioned, we're in unique circumstances here with COVID um, and it sounds like this program, it requires a, a learning coach at home. So a high, perhaps a higher level of engagement of an adult to facilitate this then might be necessary for students of older grades. Um, so, so the first question is, had there been consideration of piloting this um, beyond COVID when this was of interest in years past? And then now that we were in unique circumstances where enrollment and family needs um, may look different than hopefully in the next school year after this next one coming up. So I will start by um, speaking to the learning coach and the presence of a learning coach in the home. That is something that is embedded in our model for the online campus currently. And so we do have active learning coaches in the home and what we've seen are pretty high quality outcomes for the K-12 online program. Um, so this would simply be an extension of what has already been in place now for years. Um, our parents don't express concern with that and our parents do commit in the beginning to being learning coaches for those students who are currently in grades K through 8. And as the testimony speaks to, there is a parent who is willing to and very excited about the extension of the opportunity potentially to pre-K. Um, I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm answering the second component of your question. I'm, I apologize, Ms. Cruzy with regard to the learning coach question. So the level of involvement from a learning coach is no different for the early childhood than it is for the later grade bands? We do see it as, as somewhat nuanced, but we do have the consistent commitment of parents currently um, in the K-12 program, which uh, Tracy can speak to and what that looks like for parents. Um, I am certain that we would want to provide additional support for our parents as um, we introduce the pre-K program. Uh, there are activities envisioned by our pre-K uh, staff for those parents, but Tracy can be a little bit more specific about what that looks like now. Thanks, Kim. And then there's the question about the, uh, had the board considered a pilot? So I'll, um, I'll start with that. So the board had not um, considered a pilot, but they were fully um, supportive um, and voted to move forward um, with um, 
our request to, to submit a charter amendment to expand down to pre-K. Can I just ask a follow-up to that? Um, I mean, it's my understanding that every friendship uh, campus will be offering a online only option so that Friendship Chamberlain and Friendship Woodridge, et cetera, will all be offering virtual programs for pre-K three and pre-K four. Are what will be the curriculum you're using for that? And could that actually perhaps count as a pilot, if you will, for how this is going to work? Um, because we are slowly but surely um, all moving into the Reggio space, we have an emergent curriculum when we think about our Reggio campuses, um, where we use the standards as our driver um, and student interest. However, we do have a very rich read aloud curriculum that comes with all the lessons and we've developed them and we've thematically put them together to reach the children that we serve. We have a small group model. Um, we use the IGDI assessment to differentiate our learning in, well, during small group time. So we meet the students exactly where they are. Those lessons are written. Um, teachers also write those lessons for a small group. We develop centers based on um, student interest and where our themes are in terms of the in terms of the read alouds, um, um, in terms of Reggio, the teachers develop provocations um, that, you know, allow students to deeply invest in their interests, but they also introduce new things. So when we talk about what's developmentally appropriate for early childhood, language and literacy is key, numeracy is key, social emotional development. So we aren't using a necessarily prescribed or packaged curriculum, but we have put one together that has yielded very high results in terms of class and in terms of our assessments. Thank you. And if I could add just a little bit of color, I know it can be hard to imagine how um, this experience can work. My name is Kelly Engel and I'm a representative of the K-12 product development um, and have been working in partnership with, with Nancy and Tracy um, as they endeavor to kick off this uh, pre-K program. Um, the courses as they are set up really reflect not just um, online engagement that can be self-independent for students who are young learners, non-readers, um, driven by audio and video, but also hands-on learning that is accompanied by step-by-step -step guides so that a teacher in a classroom or a teacher in a virtual meeting such as this um, as well as a, a parent, a learning coach, can really be uh, supported in their walk through how to work with students at this developmental age. So that mixture of hands-on learning and really truly independently driven online experience is really that, that special sauce of what makes the program work for our youngest learners. I'd like to just ask a, a an enrollment slash operational question, which is for any students and families who enroll in um, this online program, pre-K through 12, who toward the end of the year, um, God willing, were able to return back to school buildings, then want to um, matriculate into in-person classrooms. How, how, if, if, let me ask, how or can that be accommodated? It certainly can be accommodated. Uh, what we have experienced is that parents may um, want to make different choices during the year for whatever reason. So the friendship community is open to accommodating any request from parents. But and you said, how would it happen? Yeah, and you so you, you would be asking parents though to explicitly um, enroll whether they want to enroll in this particular program versus pre K or for kindergarten or first that just has to be virtual in the first instance versus a program that would be in perpetuity virtual. 
Yeah, so currently the way that we operate with our K-8 to program at the online campus is that parents are enrolling in that particular program. However, what we do is honor requests from parents if they would like a change. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I will say to you that we haven't had such requests with regard to the existing online program. And I, I do want to emphasize that this program has been ex in existence for years and we do have commitment among our parents um, to participating in this program. These are families that have envisioned for whatever reason that this model is something that works best for them and their children. Um, so of course it is their choice. Um, we have not really encountered that experience throughout the history of the online program. So we don't envision that occurring here um, because I don't want to indicate that there would be some level of instability there, but certainly friendship is, in, is open to honoring any requests from families. Mm -hmm. Because I'm just, I'm just wondering if the enthusiasm for online in the current environment um, might wane. Again, lots of ifs here. Should um, schooling return somewhat more to what we anticipate? Uh, you know, in the in the spring with uh, in person in person classes, and I'm just trying to anticipate the disruption if you had. You know, a hundred families who who sign up for this program because they believe this is the right thing for them, which I fully support. Um, but then in the spring, are like, you know, what that was great, but now we're back in school three or four days a week. Let's again, all we all hope. Um, and would you be able to accommodate that? And it's not it's necessarily a, a commentary on the you know limitations of a of an online program but um, they have the opportunity to return to, a, to an in-classroom in, in setting uh, and, and how you might accommodate that challenge. And that might not happen, but I think we're just trying to explore the eventualities. Right, so, so, so certainly we would look at um, our class sizes and class loads to accommodate those requests, but um, I do, one thing that we are certain of is that the parents who have really opted to select that online campus are committed to this idea of virtual learning and homeschooling. Um, we do know that right now we're in a situation where our all grades are beginning the year virtually, potentially, um, given the current environment. And so we are extending to those families um, as we move forward and assess circumstances, any change that they would want to accommodate their needs. Um, but, but there again, as I look at our online campus, I do see that those parents have been pretty faithful to the program and stuck, hung in there with the program. And we are basing in large part our request currently on the needs expressed by families that have currently opted for that online option, which they've been a part of for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So um, while I understand your question, we are looking at the interest really arising from those families that have already committed, regardless of the circumstances in the surrounding environment, to having their students at home learning. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Cruz, if I could chime in, <clears throat> we do meet with every single new family. Nancy and I meet with them. Now, it won't be in person this year, but typically it is in person at campus to discuss the program at length to make sure that the families know what online learning is, are prepared for the school year, um, and uh, we will meet with every single family again this year by phone to talk through the process, the program, and how we can help, best practices. Uh, it, your, your question is a, a very good question. I, I don't think anybody knows what the near future holds for uh, any of the schools. Um, but we, we do try to make sure that the families are uh, well prepared and understand and committed uh, mm -hmm. 
to their, their students' education. We also know that there's very distinct choices that people make when they choose online. It's not for everyone, but people come for many different reasons. And we try to get to know the learning coach as well as the student so we can help them to address their needs. Um, we do uh, orientations. We do a lot of uh, building of learning coaches uh, ability to, to work with students um, by helping to train them and, and make suggestions as to how they can best schedule their days. Um, and when we do meet at the campus, uh, the ability to have those learning coaches meet together to discuss best practices amongst themselves, it's, it's quite engaging to listen to, to how they are, are such a part and, and become such believers of, of what is happening in their homes and happening in our school. It's, it's really, it's, it's very nice, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I also want to say that, you know, we provide a lot of extra materials for families to engage in the home. So they do their online and they are very engaged with that, but then they also have opportunities to do other activities, hands-on activities, creative activities with their children um, in the home because they're choosing to homeschool. Right. I, are I'm the, just one, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leah. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Are the families who have sought this out homeschooling or as in kind of the, the technical term homeschooling or choosing to school from home? Because they are technically this is a technical home. term choosing uh, to school from home. Right. and expected to meet certain kind of guidelines. Um, and, and my follow-up question to that is, how have, um, and maybe this is for you, Ms. Engel, how have you adopted the model as you've learned how what works and what doesn't work elsewhere? Sure, so I think every implementation is different. Um, and it, there's a lot that is left up to a school-based decision to understand what works for their population. Um, you know, we, we are certainly um, always working to transform. And uh, the most recent iteration of Embark really is, is quite different from what we would have talked about had we come to you last year. We have pulled all of our activities into the same platform that students then continue uh, forward in their studies in K through five. And so that really creates that, um, that experience that is vertically threaded throughout the courses and, and the years. And I think that's a really big change from what we've learned in terms of listening to our population, as um, many folks have said, often with siblings who have gone on into the um, upper elementary grades, looking to bring their younger siblings in their family uh, along into the same experience. And so in hearing that, um, we, we always try to be focused on, on our users and user-centric design. And, and so we, we've made a move um, also to bring all of that, that content into the same platform. So I think that's one example, but, but as I mentioned, our ability to, to always react to user feedback is, is really critical to our mission, to learn from how our users are using it and adapt in an ongoing way. Scott, do you have a question? Um, yes, just a quick question. Um, well, actually two. First, do you, have you quantified how many of your current students have three and four year old siblings? We have not. Um, and then um, Leah pointed out this different distinction between homeschooling and schooling from home. And I can see a big difference, you know, when you're talking about a fourth grader or a sixth grader. Um, but at pre-K, you know, what I'm hearing is um, that the, friendship online program would essentially provide recommended activities that parents would do with their children. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what the substantive difference would be between homeschooling with a, with a book of activities that are recommended for the parent to do and this proposed program. So the difference for us in the homeschool or in the home environment, we have mandated, scheduled, teacher-led, synchronous 
and asynchronous lessons. Uh, there are assessments there that students would need to take. There would be portfolios that students would need to submit on a quarterly basis. There's a lot more accountability in our model. Uh, these sessions online are, are scheduled in the same time every day. Students have to log in and participate with their teacher. We ask the learning coaches to sit and supervise with their child. And so it builds more of a um, cohesiveness using both the teacher, the curriculum, and the learning coach to surround the student and support the student in, in ways that really can't be done in a traditional school. Uh, some of our, our most challenging cases tend to be families that come from homeschool and they just want the freedom that they enjoy in their homeschool environment. As you, you mentioned, Scott, with a, a packet and a, a book and, and, and doing what they want when they want. Uh, we, we are very structured. Uh, we, we do have some flexibility being a, a, a virtual model, but it, it's, it's much different than just having a parent with some materials, schooling at home. And just for clarification, we are very structured as well in what we've been doing. So, so it's the same model. And I would say, thank Monique, you, correct you. me if I'm wrong, but they would still be accountable to the assessment and to the class assessment as well. That's correct. So the, account, the accountability is the same. Um, and so what, what we don't know is what that looks like um, for a teach zone in class should the state continue to use it. But um, all, all of our students, we're all one friendship, all under the same accountability. And there are built-in assessments designed uh, for adults to observe progress and track progress against learning objectives all throughout the course in every subject, and, uh, throughout the program in every subject. So at the end of, of each uh, unit, there will be an observational assessment, we call it, where an adult is prompted, whether a teacher in a virtual setting or a parent at home, um, to monitor and track that progress against key learning objectives. I also think that as a former public school teacher, access is another important critical piece of the difference between the, the public school at home pre-K model and uh, a homeschool, a school, a homeschool offering. All right. Uh, do any of our board members have any other questions at this time? All right. I don't see any. Um, again, uh, we'll be noticing a special meeting next week, uh, virtual, where we'll be voting on these matters. Um, we appreciate um, your need to have some clarity on both of the matters at hand. Uh, and uh, certainly if there are any Follow on materials given uh, our questions this evening that you'd like to send through, please do so um, in the next day or so. Thank we you. We will do that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank appreciate you. so thank many you. of you coming forward to help answer <laughs> questions. So thank I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, board members. Um, quite possibly one of the shortest agendas once we get into the actual meeting this evening. Um, so I am going to uh, ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I move to approve the July 20, 2020 board meeting agenda. Give me a second. second. All right, I got a motion and a second. A roll call vote. Uh, um, Leah Chrissy? Aye. Steve Bumbau? Aye. Naomi Shelton? Aye. Jim Sandman? Aye. There's Ray Cruz with an aye, and I have proxy votes from both Ricardo Ganjo and Saba Bereda, both uh, with ayes as well. The agenda is approved. Um, 
as it turns out, we have just a um, um, our consent calendar on the agenda for a vote this evening. Uh, before I ask for a motion, are, are there uh, any items that a board member would like to remove for further discussion, or do we have the need for any recusals? All right. Um, in that case, we have a consent calendar with our contracts and just a handful of um, charter amendments that are, appear to be uncontroversial. Could I get a motion? I move to approve all items on the consent calendar. I'll second. All right, I've got a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, roll call vote. Jim Sandman? Aye. Naomi Shelton? Aye. Leah Cruci? Aye. Steve Bumbau? Aye. And this is Rick Cruz with an aye. And I, again, I have proxy votes in favor of the consent calendar for both for Carta Ganjum and Saba Bereda. All right, um, 8.54 and we are already at new business. Is there any new business before we close this meeting? Just my, my thanks again to all of you for your really kind remarks and your support over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Gonna miss you. <laughs> we are going to sure. miss you. <laughs> Maybe right. more, sometimes more than other times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I will take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the July 20, 2020 board meeting. Second. All right. A motion is second. Roll call vote. Leah Cruci? Aye. Steve Bumbau? Aye. Naomi Shelton? Aye. Jim Sandman? Aye. And this is Rick Cruz with an aye. And I also have proxy votes from both Ricardo Ganjum and Saba Breda in favor of closing, uh, moving to adjourn our meeting. Thank you all. Stay cool. Scott, thank you again. And um, the, well, not the next time we convene. So for the friendship vote, we will have. Um, uh, Scott um, on the line, but our next formal monthly meeting, we will have our new exec executive director, Dr. Michelle Walker Davis. So um, time, of, time of transition. Appreciate it all. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you well, everyone.